May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. At our outdoor 9 a.m. service today, we celebrated the rite of holy baptism, baptizing Abe and Bax, both sons of Reverend Jesse and her husband Joe Dodson, as well as baby Theo, son of Kristen and Matthew Busa. And although you all were not there for that, baptism is a community event, so I'm bringing some of that baptism celebration into this service with us this morning. This baptism was a long time coming for Abe, particularly as it had been scheduled for him before COVID, before baby Bax and baby Thea were even a twinkle in their parents' eye. But finally, the day arrived today, and, and these three young people were grafted into the body of Christ. Now, earlier this week, I asked my friend and colleague, Jesse, when you selected this particular Sunday to baptize your two sons, did you, by chance, look at the gospel reading appointed for the day? Because if she had, I think we can all agree, it's quite a bold choice. Nothing says happy baptism quite like an exorcism. Now, to be fair, there are countless stories in the Gospels of Jesus going head to head with demons, but this particular account stands out above all the rest. In this story, our poor protagonist seems more animal-like than human, wild and unbridled. Not even chains can restrain him. He's been banished from society, forced to live in the tombs among the dead, robbed of his clothing and his dignity. And he isn't possessed by just one demon or even a few demons, but a legion of demons. Legion, a word in Jesus' time that would have conjured images of a garrison of up to 6,000 Roman soldiers. So that is a lot of demons. While I couldn't resist teasing Jesse just a little bit, it turns out that exorcisms have more in common with baptisms than you might realize. From the very early days of our Christian faith, exorcisms were part of the baptismal rite. In early Christianity, the preparation for baptism was often a years-long process. And during this extended time of formation, the catechumens would learn the essentials of the faith and undertake an intense process of repentance, a process of turning away from their old life of sin before dying and rising to new life with Christ in the waters of baptism. And as part of that process of repentance, in rites of exorcism, priests or bishops would lay hands on the catechumens and pray special prayers, seeking to banish the influence of sin and evil in their life, often anointing them with an oil of exorcism. And these rites of exorcism remained an essential part of baptism for centuries and are still observed in many Christian traditions today. Now, I imagine this talk of exorcism makes many of us uncomfortable. Perhaps it seems a bit archaic. As enlightened modern people steeped in science and reason, we don't always know what to do with concepts like evil spirits. But whatever we might think about demons, we need look no farther than Ukraine or Uvalde or Buffalo, or the shooting this past Thursday at an Episcopal church outside Birmingham, Alabama, that left three people dead. We see clearly that the power of evil in our world is real, that sin, including systemic sin like racism, poverty, and the abuse of creation, these evils have the power to destroy what is good, to deprive us of life, to break apart our homes and communities. But in God's kingdom, this evil does not have the final word. Let's remember how today's story ends. The demons are resoundingly defeated. The man is brought back into community, regains his clothing and dignity, is returned to his right mind, restored and made whole. 
The writer of Luke's gospel doesn't tell us exactly how Jesus exercised those demons. It isn't clear how exactly Jesus freed this man from his living hell. But what's abundantly clear is that the love of God incarnate in Jesus Christ had the power to heal and restore him. In this story, we see clearly that Jesus is Lord and sovereign over all creation, that he is the victor in a cosmic battle against the powers of sin and darkness, that his mission is one of reconciling what is broken and making whole what has been fractured by sin. As we wait for Jesus to return and complete this mission once and for all, as we anticipate that day when he will restore creation and make all things new, we are the ones on the front lines, continuing his mission as his body in the world. Now we know from the Easter story that still rings freshly in our ears that Jesus has already won the victory. But we also know from our observations of the world around us that the forces of evil, the demons, if you will, have not yet given up the fight. So in this time in between, when we witness the death-dealing power of sin wreaking havoc in our world, we are called to renounce it and to take action. We do this every time we serve a meal at Loaves and Fishes, when we send our youth on a mission trip next Sunday to Harlan, Kentucky, when we gather this Wednesday night to consider our response to the scourge of gun violence plaguing our country. These are the ways that we say, not today, Satan, the ways we offer a resounding no to the powers and principalities that seek to keep us chained and living among the tombs. This pattern of defiant renunciation begins in our baptisms. And this morning, the parents and godparents of Theo, Abe, and Bax, in front of the gathered assembly, renounced Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. In these words, they renounced the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. And having made those renunciations, they then reaffirmed their allegiance to Jesus Christ and their pledge to put their whole trust in his grace and love. Then by the power of the Holy Spirit through water and ancient prayers, Theo, Abe, and Bax were grafted into the church of Jesus Christ, that wonderful and sacred mystery, empowered to participate in God's mission with all of us. Now, it's not always an easy mission, nor is it always a popular one. Remember, that at the end of our gospel passage, the people did not celebrate the possessed man's restoration. They did not witness the miraculous thing Jesus did and sign up to be part of his movement. No, instead, they asked Jesus to leave. They were afraid. Because the power of God's healing and reconciling love can be frightening. It can be too costly for some. But thanks be to God, today, Theo, Abe, and Bax, through their parents and godparents, said yes to this redemptive love. Today, they said no to the evil powers of this world and yes to God's love in Jesus. May we who have taken these vows do all in our power to support them in their life in Christ and to join them in going from here to proclaim just how much Jesus has done for us. Amen.